we had a good range of speakers and the level of knowledge and expertise they brought about the state of the church in the modern world, the proportions of people, the belief systems, the challenges and so on, are for me fantastically informative. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second debate in this Westminster Faith debate series. And our topic today is, can historic global churches maintain central authority or must they devolve? With globalisation in the world, with the process of change place, taking place so very, very rapidly in all aspects of our life, economic, social, technological, uh, and so on, the question then arises is what is happening to the great organised churches of the world and how they deal with the diversity that has been established, with the instant communication around the world that exists, and what is the nature of their authority and organisation uh, in the, uh, this period of massive change. Um, you can see it manifest in issues like the controversies when a new pope uh, is selected, about the essence of the doctrine which he will promote, his decisions, what that means in continents throughout the world, and a completely different state of affairs than used to be the position, say, 20, 30 years ago. You can see it in the Anglican Church with the controversies about issues like gay marriage and the extent to which uh, whatever is the teaching which originates here in this country, in, in, in England, to what extent does that writ run in many other countries throughout the world? Should it run throughout the world? What's the right way to deal with it? How can one move it forward? What is it in the modern world which unites people who are of the same faith? Uh, is it doctrine? Uh, is it a set of teachings and beliefs? Is it the organisation? Is it the values? Is it the utility of the church? And what are these things and how do they in practice operate in the modern arena? Should one be talking about a more devolved uh, church authority in different countries throughout the world? Is it possible to maintain a central authority that runs so strongly in countries which are so very different with so much such different histories, so many different issues addressing those questions? First of all, we have Professor Kirstine Kim, who is Professor of Theology and World Christianity at Leeds Trinity. She's helped open up the subject to more global perspective and she uh, is particularly expert in two areas where she has lived and worked and studied in <laughs> India and Korea. Kirsten. Um, in our book, um, Christianity as a World Religion, which um, um, Linda has just referred to, um, Sebastian Kim and I predicted the weakening of the uh, ties binding historic global churches. On the basis of our survey of world Christianity, we emphasised the way that it takes local shape in different continents and regions, and that most Christian populations are overwhelmingly in the global south and east. The determining factor that holds historic global churches together is, in many cases, the formal links created by denominational mission activity in the European colonial period. However, most of the colonial churches have now become world communions or alliances. And these are not hierarchical and centralised structures, but flat, conciliar-type groupings, which meet around the Lord's table and share some resources, though they may cover a wide spectrum of theologies and practices. The great exception to this reordering of global Christian relationships is the Roman Catholic Church. In that historic global church, uh, which we have to remember is half of all Christians, a hierarchical structure and central teaching authority has been maintained, although not without significant membership losses and tensions. Furthermore, 16% of Christians today are in churches that um, are in the category independent in the sense of not being part of historic global churches at all. So these churches have their own outward-facing global vision, and they do not see the future of Christianity in a Eurocentric way. If they consider Europe at all, they see it as a mission field and regard themselves as the agents who will help us recover and revive our faith. Uh, and now to Alan Anderson. Uh, Alan is... 
Professor of Mission and Pentecostal Studies at the University of Birmingham uh, and an expert on Pentecostalism worldwide, one of the world's leading experts in that subject uh, and specialist also in Asia and also in Africa. Alan. In answer to the question of the debate, I, I, I want to look first of all at the dem dem demography of Christianity and just for those of you that are not aware of this, just what has happened to uh, world Christianity in the 20th century. Um, despite the secularization of Europe um, and the Western world on the whole during the last century and its effects, there's been a remarkable resurgence of Christianity, especially in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. The strongholds of Christianity uh, are no longer Rome and Canterbury, but Lagos, Nairobi, Rio de Janeiro, Manila, and Seoul. In 1900, just to give you some rough statistics, around 90% of Christians lived in Europe and North America. By 1970, that proportion had dropped to 57%. And today, only 35% of Christians live in Europe and North America, which of course means that two-thirds of Christians live outside uh, Europe and North America. But it's not just the numbers that have shifted, and this brings me to the second point, that it's not just the demographics, but it's also the character of Christianity that has fundamentally changed. At least a quarter of the world's Christians are thought to belong to some version of Pentecostalism, including charismatic renewals in Catholic, Anglican, and Protestant churches. And just as the world has recoiled from colonialism, there is also increasing opposition and resentment against any kind of ecclesiastical control from the north. The Anglican Communion is holding itself together precariously. The new Pope Francis, the first ever Pope from outside Europe, although with the familiar Italian ancestry, has breathed new life into the Catholic Church, which I think bodes well for the future, and one wonders whether there will ever be a European Pope again. So my answer to the debate question before us is, for me, a no-brainer. Whether we like it or not, the historic churches will be forced to devolve or they will continue to decline. It's now my job to introduce <clears throat> our next two uh, presenters. Uh, the first is Christopher Landau, uh, who is a Church of England deacon and undertaking postgraduate research in Christian ethics at Oxford University. He's a member of the BBC Radio 4 Daily Service presenting team and a former BBC World Service Religious Affairs correspondent, and so has an excellent perspective from which to consider the questions which have been raised. Christopher. I feel as though I sit somewhere between Pentecostal freedom and Catholic order, and the question is whether that uh, only results in Anglican fudge uh, or something approaching a creative tension. Um, during my years as a journalist, uh, I often found myself probing whether that Anglican middle way had any credibility to it. But the Anglican Communion website does at least have a stab at this and says in, I think, just wonderfully understated prose, as with any family, the Anglican Communion's members have a range of differing opinions. <laughs> this means that the Anglican Christian tradition has always valued its diversity and has never been afraid publicly to tackle the hard questions of life and faith. Actually, I wonder whether therein is... Um, actually something of a strength, the fact that Anglicans are willing to discuss this stuff openly in public in a way that often other churches, however they are constituted, will be reluctant to do so. An example of this is that in 1888 at the Lambeth Conference, what has evolved into the once a decade gathering of Anglican bishops from around the world, the vexed question of polygamy was discussed. And the conference resolved as follows, that the wives of polygamists may, in the opinion of this conference, be admitted in some cases to baptism, but that it must be left to the local authorities of the church to decide under what circumstances they may be baptised. 
And that, it seems to me, is a fascinating nugget of Anglican history, that there was a decision to refer a controversial issue which was being discussed by bishops of the communion as a whole back down to the local level for resolution. Uh, our final panellist is Paul Vallely, who's a writer, broadcaster, lecturer and consultant, uh, written in a wide range of media outlets in various ways. His areas of expertise include ethics, religion, and international development. He's visiting professor in public ethics and media at the University of Chester and a senior research fellow at the Brooks World Poverty Institute at Manchester University. He's the author of the best-selling biography, very important, best-selling biography of the new Pope, Pope Francis, Untying the Knots. And classically, there's a balance to be struck between, on the one hand, an authoritarian magisterium which safeguards the orthodoxy of the faith, and on the other, a lively and authentic expression of Christianity acting in the lives of individual <coughs> believers. And there are dangers at both extremes. At its most disciplinary, a central authority can stifle personal religious integrity with rules and dogma, and cynics might call that Roman Catholicism. And at its most chaotic, unregulated individualism can become utterly relativist, and the appeal to sola scriptura, which we might parody as Protestantism, only dodges the thorny problem of how is the Bible to be interpreted and by whom and how prescriptively. Now, in the Vatican, Pope Francis is, is moving, as the speakers have said, to redress what he sees, and I, I agree with him, is a, a historic imbalance of the 19 cardinals who were made uh, at the weekend uh, only a handful are from Europe, and most are from the developing world, and some are from the very poorest places on the planet. Now, in the balance we're talking about, Catholic conservatives are wary. Uh, Cardinal Muller, who's the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the Vatican's chief doctrinal guardian of orthodoxy, has no doubt been reminding Pope Francis that the lesson of history is that revolutions come when authoritarian regimes liberalise. But Francis, I think, is undeterred by this, and his strategy seems to be to let a thousand flowers bloom. And in a funny way, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has come up with a similar solution. At the General Synod, he urged the church not to be afraid of incoherence and inconsistency. And I suspect Pope Francis, who famously said that he preferred a church which goes out and risks being involved in accidents to one which stays safe and sterile at home, I suspect the Pope would agree with the Archbishop. When he made those remarks, the Pope concluded by saying, God is always creative, never closed, and that is why he is never rigid. To be faithful, one must be creative, one must be able to change. Change is essential, but anarchy is not. I mean, sitting here listening to that, I don't know if it struck you in the audience as well, um, the difference in, I don't know, tone or values between the two, the two groups of speakers, uh, Kirstine and Alan, um, you were talking about the health of the churches, the growth, the future, whether it's going to be decline or growth. Uh, Christopher and Paul, you were talking very much about unity as an ideal. I would like to ask the two of you, what's so important about unity? I mean, a lot, uh, I think, rests for me on, uh, in John's Gospel, uh, chapter 13, verse 35, by this you will know that they are my disciples. See how they love one another. To what extent is Christ visible in the way that people have these debates about sexuality, the role of women's ministry? And it's like we've stopped caring about the kind of picture we share with the wider world but if love is what you're trying to show, mm. you talked about the Church of England describing itself as a family. Well, it's a very, very dysfunctional family. Uh, if you have a dysfunctional family, would it not be better to say, well, why don't you stop living together and do your own things with your own integrity, maybe under a, a sole banner, but through breaking up the attempt to be one and agree a doctrine, then you can actually love each other better. Why not let go a bit of this attempt to have impose a unity <coughs> for the sake of love? I don't think that uh, it's about unity, actually. Um, I think it's more about um, uh, um, inclusion and exclusion. 
and uh, certainly as a, as speaking as a Catholic, um, I don't feel any problem with, with um, a, a sense of unity. I think that there's been a sense of rigidity and a sense of people feeling um, excluded from the church. And one of the things that Francis has done is that, that there's a tremendous lightness in the church now. There's a joy and, and people feel, there's no fear. Theologians don't look over their shoulders before they speak now. There's often a misunderstanding that unity means there should be one church. Um, historically, I don't think there ever has be, or been one church. Even if you go back to the first centuries of Christianity, from the very beginning, Christianity was diverse and polycentric. And that's reflected in the, in the New Testament um, throughout, um, most predominantly in the fact that we have four Gospels representing four different churches in different parts of the world. Uh, or the question of unity. Actually, the churches that have united have very often done so under pressure political pressure, largely. Um, you can look at the churches in Japan, for example, before the war. The churches in Korea were also forced to uh, unite. The churches in India um, united voluntarily, but under a lot of pressure from the wider Hindu community to be one body, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So I tend to be suspicious of, of movements towards unity because I wonder um, you know, where the authority is coming from for that unity. And, and the question is, of course, uh, do we have a free-for-all, which is really what, what many of the new uh, Pentecostal groups, charismatic groups and so on are doing, is, is really, you know, everybody sets up a church here and there and, and all over the place. And some of them are very successful, but they run on market principles, you know, free market association. You know, as I do from seeing these churches elsewhere in the world, that uh, part of the appeal of the charismatic churches is that there's huge voice and choice for the people involved. Mm -hmm. They're much more democratised in that sense. You have everyone there has a real input yes. into the life of that church. Now, that just doesn't happen in the historic churches, including in, 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 in the West. Yes, I think it's... Is it going to have to happen to them? But if it does, they're going to have to completely reorder and yes. rethink think themselves, I think, I think, there, I think they, you've raised I... several points there, and I think one of them is the, is, the, um, is the fact that in many of these churches throughout the world, there is much more participation mm -hmm. by the laity, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the lessons that I, I do think that some of the historic churches are learning and are, are trying to practice in many parishes. But Francis is letting everybody have their views because he's felt that there has been an insufficiency of, of that kind of dialogue in the, in the past. And uh, so we have, we've had a, um, a, a survey of the laity, um, which has produced some pretty radical results, particularly in Japan, where, where the, the Catholics have told, uh, um, uh, the, the, the Catholic bishops have told the Vatican that um, the, 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 train, the train has left the station, as one uh, American um, uh, bishop put it, uh, on things like uh, contraception. Uh, these, these things are just ignored. So we're going to take uh, questions from the floor now. We're going to take them in batches of three. Isn't it the case that the drive for unity now is mostly coming from the south, from people who see a wonderful new Christian order run by them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I loved the reason that uh, Archbishop Justin Welby ended up having to give for not being able to attend the GAFCON, which is one of the big Global South movement gatherings, in a wonderfully English establishment way. I'm sorry I can't come. I've got to baptise Prince George. One of Francis's aides told me that uh, he'd once said, uh, who are these people in Rome, in their shrinking church, to be telling us in the developing world with our growing church that we're doing things wrong? Uh, it's about dis uh, dysfunctional families and the Anglican communion. Uh, because Anglicans have argued bitterly over the centuries, it's not a new thing. So, is that being dysfunctional, or is it a family which, as uh, Christopher said at the beginning from the Anglican website, is happy to air its or does it air its disagreements in public? Uh, and is that dysfunctional, or is it a sign of vigour and integrity? Um, one of the biggest challenges I felt I had as a journalist was to try and burst the bubbles of um, mutual mystification and demonisation by different Anglican interest groups in a way that, you know, wounds the body of Christ, I now say, uh, with my collar turned around this way. Um, mm. And that's the real challenge, I think, for Anglicans. Can I look <coughs> my Ugandan brother or sister Anglican in the eye and say, you too are a cherished child of God, even if we disagree profoundly on something. And that's the challenge. 
So going back to where we started with, uh, is, it, is, it, is it a dysfunctional family? I suppose part of the answer is, if somebody's being abused in it, if there are groups who really can't be heard, who are being completely silenced, then it's dysfunctional. If not, it might be a good and healthy and interesting thing. Um, is Pope Francis thinking along the lines of collegiality specifically? And if that is the case, um, is this the right time for a Vatican III? Um, I think most people would feel that they haven't done Vatican II yet, so we don't need <laughs> Vatican III. I wonder whether um, finance is at the heart of where power lies. So if you can afford to have uh, your church without any links to the central, then you can afford to do whatever you wish. A more cynical look at this. It's all about numbers. It's all about the power of these churches. That's actually what's driving all this. Mm -hmm. That the more numbers you have in the church, the more money you've got for the leader of the church. And, and you're quite right, the leader does often... Um, not, is not accountable to anybody for what happens, and often that leads to all sorts of um, difficulties. We've had some very recent events where this has happened. And we haven't mentioned in our discussion yet the fact that uh, the, the fastest growing churches worldwide tend to be ones which are prosperity focused and which do promise material blessing and welfare. There is a, a type of prosperity theology that I'm prepared to support, um, and that is a prosperity theology which is basically a community development. And many of the um, churches um, in poorer parts of the world do operate as communities developing themselves. And, um, and in Korea, you've got an example of a, of a national enterprise towards development, which the churches were very much behind. And so Korean prosperity theology was about making South Korea a prosperous nation so that it couldn't be trampled over by other powers again. Um, and so that uh, Koreans could live a good life like everybody else. There are all sorts of reasons why people go to churches that have a prosperity emphasis, uh, not the least of which is that people find there some kind of hope for their, their desperate poverty that mm. they actually live in. Mm. I don't think we who enjoy um, many of the world's goods should be condemning people who are poor and are aspiring to prosperity. And I would argue that there's much in the gospel about the kingdom of God being a very nice place in which to, to live, uh, where people's needs are, are met and more than then, you know, where their cup overflows. I think I just wanted to highlight that um, we seem to be talking about devolving authority in terms of devolving visible structures of hierarchy and power. Um, and we seem to be holding up independent churches as though they have a devolved power. But power and authority isn't only exercised through these such structures. It can be far more capillary. A, a question is, do we need to think a bit more about what we mean by power and authority um, in terms of this debate? Thank you all very much. And uh, this brings me back to the, the women issue as well, I think. It's a thread that ties together several of those questions about happy or healthy families or maybe abusive ones uh, and about where power is really lying and about whether you can have unity while women still don't really have any, any role in the churches. Or well, take it another way you want. Alan, over to you. I, I think uh, on, the, uh, on the question of the participation of women, I think we've still got a long way to go. And I think um, uh, certainly um, uh, Protestant churches and uh, shall I say, to a, to a, a more limited extent, uh, Pentecostal churches have, have allowed women in leadership. And, and certainly women are the majority in these churches and often have a, a very strong voice, even when there is a male hierarchical leadership in them. If you're going to gaze into your crystal ball, do you think that those churches are going to get there first in terms of women's full participation or the historic more centralised churches? Well, personally, I, I mean, historically, they did get there first. Mm. But then they, mm. they, they were, if you like, subsumed into yeah. particularly American evangelicalism, yeah. which has a strong anti-women yeah. uh, leadership position. And I think that was part of the problem. Yes, power and authority is used in um, lots of different ways. And um, finance is one of the means of exerting power and authority. When he was asked, could a woman become a cardinal? Because you don't have to be a priest to be a cardinal. Um, he said, oh no, but, uh, clericalism is the problem. Why, you know, we don't want more clerics. We don't want women to be clerics. Now, is that, is that, is that a profound thought or is that a piece of nifty footwork? <laughs> <laughs> 
But as I know from the, the, you know, the scripts I've been writing for years, and Andrew here and others will know, um, you know, journalists were confidently predicting the demise and the schism of the Anglican Communion for years and years. And actually, it still hasn't happened. I mean, we can argue about the... You think it has. I absolutely yeah. disagree. But, um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the, the picture is not as bleak as we might think. But I think it's, it's because um, some of the leaders, even from their... Western imperialist traditional Canterbury locations are nonetheless seeing a responsibility to speak for the whole church from those privileged positions and um, and try and get the rest of us to stop arguing like rats in a sack. You know. Now, my experience is that in that thinking about change, leaders have to really promote discussion and consideration of the issues that are at stake, the kind of issues we've been talking about here. And if you don't permit that kind of relatively open expression of views and discussion, whether it's on teachings and doctrine, whether it's on forms of organisation or whatever, you really do risk just narrowly going down the same tracks and going off the tracks at some later point down the road. So for me, the question, I mean, it seems to me beyond doubt when we were talking about those different categories of unity, the values and conduct, the doctrine and teachings and the organisation, it seems to me beyond doubt that change is necessary. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't start by saying we've got to really think about this, mm. then you're in real trouble. Uh, and that's, that's really where we have to start and say, well, is change necessary? Well, it is. How do we conduct it? Mm. 